Hey everybody, welcome back to Occult Perspectives. So, for today's video, I would like to continue staying with the ceremonial magic stuff. Um, in the last video, I had covered the four solar adorations, along with um, some s additional notes on um, invoking and banishing. Um, for the lesser banishing or lesser invoking ritual of the pentagram. Today, although I don't have a whole lot of experience myself with this ritual yet, I've just started it, I already have a pretty good understanding of it, and that would be the lesser banishing ritual of the hexagram. Um, because it's so similar to the, the lesser banishing ritual of the pentagram, and it's usually um, not taught or learned in the Golden Dawn system anyway, until not the neophyte degree, the zero, zero degree, but it's either zero, one, I'm sorry, one, ten. I think it's one equals ten because it has something to do with the, um, the placement on the tree of life. But the first one anyway is zero equals zero. That's the neophyte. And that's not even a fully fledged member of the order. I think Zelator is the first one, um, the first degree after neophyte. And that's where they go ahead and teach you the lesser hexagram of um, the lesser banishing ritual of the hexagram um, on top of the lesser banishing ritual of the pentagram. Okay. Got some notes here. But yeah, um, if you have not gone back and watched my lesser banishing ritual um, pentagram videos, um, go back and watch those because I have a part one, two, and three. Um, it's a lot of additional notes to what people would normally teach you. There's better videos to actually show you how it's done, but if you want a full squared away, um, fully explained um, with a lot of additional correspondences and such, my videos are pretty good about covering everything and explaining the differences between the lesser invoking ritual of the pentagram, the lesser banishing ritual of the pentagram, um, when to use them, um, just watch any of my videos that I've done on the Ceremonial Magic playlist. I'm just trying to bring information together. Um, and before I forget to mention, I really wanted to mention his name in this video. Um, Damien Ecoles. I think it's his last name is E-C-H-O-L-S, if I'm spelling that correctly. Um, I, pol I apologize if I'm not. Um, his channel is really, really good. He takes a lot of these topics and even advanced esoteric subjects and he condenses them down and demystifies them and makes it understandable even to the person who's just, you know, getting into a lot of this stuff. Um, so he's very knowledgeable. And he's taking some questions and ideas and concepts that I've been stirring around for a long time in my own mind and my own consciousness, and it's kind of like reconciling a lot of those things for me. So check him out. Um, if you've ever watched the show on Netflix, um, it's The Midnight Gospel, which... Me and all my friends uh, were waiting for season two. Uh, it's a great show. But he does the episode, uh, it's either episode two or three. It's the fish, uh, the guy that has a head. Um, it's like a fishbowl head. That's Damien Nichols being interviewed in that um, episode. But Damien has his own YouTube channel where he goes more into this stuff and it's just incredible. So check out Midnight Gospel and check out Damien Nichols. Alrighty, the lesser banishing ritual of the hexagram. What is the purpose? It banishes things not only on a microcosmic level like the uh, lesser banishing ritual of the pentagram does, but on a macrocosmic level. Microcosmic, smaller. Macrocosmic, big. We're pulling that magnifying lens up, you know, and seeing the bigger picture. The word used in this, there's four different uh, sacred god names that are used in the lesser banishing and the lesser invoking ritual of the pentagram. This one is Ararita, A-R-A-R-I-T-A. -A -A. Um, it's a notericon or acronym. So each letter is the first letter of a word. And since it has um, seven letters, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, Ararita, um, it's seven words, and they're Hebrew words, but it's the first letter of each of those words. And the rough definition of this word is unity. Um, the English translation of 
um, this Notericon is one is his unity, one is his individuality, his permutation is one, and um, another, I guess, a synonym for permutation would be arrangement. So his arrangement is one, his permutation is one. Um, so this name, Ararita, um, symbolizes unity of divinity. Um, and the seven letters that I mentioned, um, those are also symbolic of the seven letters. <laughs> the seven letters. Those are the seven letters that are symbolic of the seven planets. Could have organized my notes a little better. The seven days of creation. Um, and there's lots of other correspondences, you know. Um, the seven chakra system. Um, you've got the seven steps in masonry, if you know what that's all about. Um, so... It goes on and on a lot. The, the number seven has many, many, many meanings, but you can apply that to this sacred god name, this Aura Rita, which will, you will be using to vibrate at each quarter like you did in the Lesser Vanishing Ritual of the Pentagram. But instead of drawing pentagrams this time, you draw hexagrams, which some of them are actually a little bit easier, um, in my opinion, to draw uh, thus far. Um, so basically... Um, yeah, to start out uh, this ritual, you would face the east like you would in the Lesser Banishing Ritual of the Pentagram. And you do the Kabbalistic Cross, you know, which is where you pull the light down from Kether. Um, you visualize yourself growing taller and taller and taller. And, um, you know, towering above um, in, in space, um, above the planets, above the Milky Way, above you know, the universe, the galaxy, you know, and ultimate source is above you. You're pulling that white light down. Um, this is all stuff I've covered in previous videos too. Um, so I'm just going to hit on it real briefly. You know, your feet are still planted in earth, but your head is high in the heavens. And that's really the whole idea. You don't want to get stuck completely in that spiritual realm because we're physical beings having a physical experience, but you also don't want to get trapped in the material realm to the degree that you feel like a prisoner. You know, you realize where your job and your dharma is here on earth, but you also have that connection to the higher worlds too. But you also don't want to get lost in just the higher realms and lose, you know, what your role and your individuality is here in the physical world and what your job is, um, what you're supposed to be doing here um, on earth. So getting back to the ritual, you're facing the east, you do the Kabbalistic cross, you pull down, from Kether and do the Ata, Malkut, Vigbura, Vigdula, Leolam, or Leolam is usually how I pronounce it. And if you have, you have a dagger in your hands normally, and then Amen, you point it up towards the heavens. So you go to the east, and instead of drawing a pentagram this time, you draw the pentagram, I'm sorry, the hexagram of fire. And I was actually kind of doodling around. Um, in my notebook the other day and I draw a pretty I was able to draw a pretty good one let's see if I can find it and then Nova my fiance's daughter traced over it which was pretty cool so here's kind of a this is my rough not very pretty um, outline of the fire hexagram it's like one triangle above the other. Hers is actually cooler. She See, she traced that, and then she's got more stuff going on down here, which I hadn't even drawn. So she knows what's up. And then there was a, yeah, pentagram. I was doodling, too. I'm trying to learn, by you know, by drawing these shapes and such, not only how to draw them when we're doing the ritual, but also um, how to um, visualize it. Visualization is really tough sometimes. You know, as you're doing it, you want to see you know, the colors and the shapes, the pentagrams and the hexagrams in front of you. There's more, it's hard to see the yellow ones, but all these various hexagrams here. I guess if you get in the darker light, it's kind of easier to see in the pentagrams as such. So, when you're facing the east, this first one, as you just saw, um, the first, so we're going to start each one of these, um, these vanishing hexagrams, it's gonna form a triangle that starts at the top. You start at the top every single time, and you go down to the left. I don't know how that looks from, I'm probably going right on the camera, but you come down to the left. 
you go across, and then you go back up. So each one of these starts out with a, a triangle that's being drawn from the top down to the left. Or from the video, it might be this direction, but you see what I'm saying. So it would be like this, this, and this. Wow, it's really hard to do, just looking at the camera. But then the second triangle is drawn, it's the same way, you draw the top down to the left for the fire one. But the first triangle is the same in every single one. And you can look this up online too, you know, just look up lesser, um, the lesser banishing ritual of the hexagram. You'll find it on YouTube, you'll find it on Google, wherever. Um, the reason I'm not quoting Modern Magic as much for this ritual is because it's his, I don't know, I found a version that's much more straightforward and I'm gonna cover that instead of getting into um, Donald Craig's. Um, he doesn't put this ritual in until way later in the book, but it's really not that hard of a ritual. And so this is a more condensed version um, we're gonna do here. So you go to the east and now you've drawn these, these two, it's the top one you draw first, you see so you draw that in the air and then you draw this and you imagine this golden flame you know, and then as in the Lesser Vanishing Ritual of the Pentagram, you do the sign of the enter, you know, you breathe in. Imagine this energy from the earth as, you know, rushing through you, you know, up into your body, and then you let it out through uh, where the pentagram, or where the triangles meet. So for the fire one, I don't know if they really mean here or here, I would assume. Um they mean this section right here because that I guess that's where the triangles actually meet but then there's this point in the middle but essentially you just want to vibrate in the middle of it you know there, there's probably more information on that as I said I'm just getting started on this and you vibrate the name as we said before Ararita you know the full exhalation of that you breathe in all the energy from the earth and the, uni the universe is coming up into you and then you're exhaling it Ah, Ra, Rita, and then you give the sign of silence afterwards. I believe so because it makes sense if you're doing the banishing. It's called the lesser banishing ritual of the hexagram. So as in with the, it depends on the person because some people give the sign of silence every time. Other people will only do it for banishing rituals, but not for invoking um, for if they want to if they're invoking it and they want to pull the energies towards them, they're not trying to silence it. You know, they're, it's invoking rather than banishing. So, but when you do things such as the middle pillar ritual, you're also invoking. So that fire hexagram is that first one. And I forgot to mention too, the elements also change in the lesser banishing ritual of the hexagram. So in the east originally, which is, was confusing to me at first well, as well. And the reason for this is because the elements, um, they're different on the macrocosm, which the Lesser Vanishing Ritual of the Hexagram covers, versus the microcosm, as we were saying before. Um, so when, on the physical plane versus the, you know, this is based in the zodiac or the stars, I believe, or the celestial plane, um, maybe more the Hokma realm, you know, because uh, we're getting into a lot of Kabbalah stuff here. It's so much to try and cover. Um, I'm not even going to be able to cover as much as I thought I was going to in this video because I wanted to get past this ritual and cover some other Kabbalah notes that I had gotten to, but we're not going to be able to do that, I don't think, because we're already at like 14 minutes. So you've got Kether at the top of the Tree of Life, which is the White Sephiroth, and then Hokmah is the next one down, and Hokmah represents the Zodiac, or the First Motion. Um, so that's probably more where this is based, you know, this Earth and then the Zodiac, um, I'm not sure what they mean when they say the macrocosm as in the ultimate unity with source, past, Kether. This is getting into some more, I guess, deeper um, Kabbalistic um, terminology and such. Not so much terminology, but theory and, um, yeah, mostly theory. But anyway, I'm getting off track. So, in the east is fire. Um, you move to the south, which would normally be fire in the Lesser Banishing Ritual and the, the Pentagram Ritual. I'm just gonna start saying Pentagram and Hexagram Ritual now. But in the Hexagram Ritual, the south is earth. 
and you do that, you vibrate that same name, Ararita, in the south as you did in the east, but this time you're drawing an earth. Um, and like I said, each triangle starts the same. So that first triangle, it's down, it starts up, and it goes down and to the left, to the right, up, meets back up at the top. So this time, the earth one's going to be, it's a hexagram essentially, so you're going from the bottom up to the right, to the left, and back down. That's a really sloppy one. Um, not very good. Let's see if I can redo that. So it starts from every triangle when you're doing these hexagrams, starts from the top, and goes down to the bottom left corner, to the right hand corner, and back up. And, but on the Earth hexagram, remember, we're in the south now. We've gone from the east to the south. We've drawn, um, instead of the blue flaming pentagrams, this time the hexagrams are a golden flame. And you're connecting it before, as, um, as with the pentagram ritual, with a white line. Um, so you've drawn this white line around. You're in the south now. And you're drawing this, you know, you go down to the left, right, back up. And then you start from the bottom and you go up and to the right, to the left, and back down. That one's really sloppy too. Um, but I feel like when I'm in the zone and I'm actually doing them, I feel... And you know, it's more about your imagination. If you see it, you know, crystal clear as... Um, you may not visualize it crystal clear, but as long as you know that you're doing it, you know, make sure your lines are crisp. And just try to be as accurate as possible. It's not always going to be possible um, every single time, but for me so far, I feel like I've done a really good job. So just try to look up, um, I don't have my laptop with me today, so um, try to look up some other versions of these. So the first one, I'll go ahead and draw them again. The first one, looks like this pretty much fire south you're gonna do earth instead of fire like in the pentagram ritual it's a little bit better not too much better but that's earth which is the hexagram and for the second triangle you're starting from the bottom and you go up to the right and then to the left and back down then you trace after you've vibrated the Ararita with the sign of the enter. And if you're not sure about the sign of the enter, you know, you probably are not even at this level yet. So I'm not going to go ahead and show you what it looks like because you should already know. But you've vibrated Ararita once again in the south, which is now the earth element. You trace this white line around um, to the west. Now the west this time is air. So to draw the air one, it starts at the top, goes down to the left, over to the right, and back up like every other triangle starts out. Now this one, it goes down from the right-hand side. It goes down and to the left, back up, and you draw this line. Oh, oops, I can't see. It's hard to trace it right here. So I'll draw it one more time. This triangle. And then this, so they're connected like that. Now, you start from the bottom and you go up towards the right, across, and back down. Up and to the right, across, and back down. You uh, vibrate the god name Ararita once again. You know, exhaling the full time after pulling the energy up and doing the inhale, and then you. Ararita. Sign of silence if you so choose. Go from uh, the west, trace the white line to the north now. And this is the final one, and the north is water this time on the macrocosmic level. Um, so it's the same triangle um, as before you go down and to the left, across and up. So there you've got your triangle for the water element, but this time 
The second triangle actually starts at the top of this one, and it goes up and to the right, across, and back down, like so. And then you would vibrate, you know, right where the lines, the triangles meet. So it's here on this one, and then it's here on this one. And then I guess for this one, I would vibrate it right in the middle. And then for this one, I don't know if they mean up at the top here or if they mean somewhere across here. But as long as you vibrate the names where they end up connecting. So this is the first one, fire, earth, it's a poorly drawn one, air, and then water. And I'll do water one more time. So that first triangle is the same every single time. But then you go up and to the right, across, and back down. That one looks really bad, it's not very even, but you get the idea. This one's actually drawn a little bit better. And you kind of darken that in a little bit. And you know, if you're really doing these rituals, you'll be doing more research on them anyway. Um, this video is just to kind of give you like my insights to them and um, a little additional information that you may not have received originally. And so once you've connected, you know, you've drawn your line all the way around as you uh, would in the pentagram ritual. And now you're seeing all the pentagrams at each quarter, you know, blazing uh, fiery blue. But now you also see the golden hexagrams um, overlaid in it as well. Okay. So, uh-oh, lost my notes that I had because I went to a page where I could draw. I'm writing so many different notes in this, it's kind of crazy. Okay. So yeah, the golden flame of each hexagram, it's, they're all connected by the bright white light at the end. Um, you're visualizing the blue flames of the lesser banishing ritual of the pentagram. And you can pretty much be done with your rituals at this point. If you do one, you know, any other rituals, you know, after the Lesser Banishing Ritual, the Hexagram, you probably want to do a Lesser Banishing Ritual, the Pentagram, again, just to seal all the work. That ritual is typically done, you know, to just go ahead and seal all of the work. Um, one of the things I noticed, I'm just going to go ahead and give a side note, when I performed this for the first time, uh, this Lesser uh, Banishing Ritual of the Hexagram, I noticed when I would go out into public, I had more of protection around me. It felt like my aura had increased, you know. Um, I had this, um, I was at the store with my fiance and it felt like we were protected, you know, more from outside influences. I had like this bubble or the shield or this Merkaba around me and I was able to see glints of holographic, if that even makes sense. It seemed like everything was kind of like sparkly or glittery. And um, that was the sensation I got after kind of getting out of the house the first time, you know, do it, doing the, um, hexagram ritual. So overall, I, I think it's the same effect as this, um, but you're merging the pentagram and the hexagram together. You know, you're bringing the macrocosm and the microcosm together. Um, they're merging. So you're bringing more harmony as above, so below, that whole hermetic axiom and whatnot, you know, so. Um, and there's something to do with, you know, you don't want too much water, you don't want too much fire. So if you, if you're doing, this hexagram ritual it's supposed to kind of even out these elements you know for you and because the different elements as Damien Nichols puts really well they represent different different aspects of ourselves fire is the will water is the emotions you know air is the intellect and earth is just you know our physical selves our body um, pertaining to physical or material things um let's see okay so that pretty much covers um yeah that covers the hexagram stuff i suppose we're at 24 minutes now i have a little bit more time i won't get into these notes too too much but i'm going to jump back into modern magic and just go over some kabbalah theory real quick um, some additional notes that i took uh, starting on page 63 so there's three sacred literatures for the Kabbalah. Uh, the ancient Hebrews, the Torah, which is comprised of the first five books of the Jewish Bible, the Talmud, and the Kabbalah. Um, the Talmud is commentaries on the Torah, and the Kabbalah is mystical interpretations of the Torah and speculations on the nature of God and the universe. 
The Torah was known as the body of the tradition. It was said that if ignorant people would read the Torah, they would profit from the experience. The Talmud was called the Jew's rational soul. And the, those who were learned would profit from its study. The Kabbalah was called the Jew's immortal spirit, and the wise were advised to meditate upon it. And this reminds me of something from uh, a chapter in Manly P. Hall's The Secret Teachings of All Ages. It says, those with understanding do not look upon the... Um, oh, how's it start out? There's the written law, which every man may see. Those with understanding do not look upon the garment, but at the body beneath it. The moral and intellectual code. Um, the intellectual and philosophical code, I'm sorry. And then it says, the wisest, of, the wisest of all, however, the servants of the heavenly kingdom, look at nothing save the soul, which is the um, spiritual doctrine. The eternal and ever-springing root of the law. Something along those lines. You know how manly P. Hall is. He's got really good stuff. Um, so you've got these three sacred texts, it looks like. Um, the three sacred literatures, literatures explain. Um, there's no right way to spell Kabbalah. I mean, there's so many different spellings of it. He goes on to say in here that, you know, just kind of go with the one that um, you want to, really. There's probably at least ten different spellings mentioned in this book. And then there's so many more spellings, you know. Later on, it doesn't really matter, per se. Looks like I can go ahead and go on to the next page. This looks interesting, though. Turning to look at Hebrew as it is spoken today. That does not help understanding of Hebrew pronunciation. Modern Hebrew is not the same as biblical Hebrew. At the beginning of the last century, a man named Elazir ben Yehuda became to believe that Hebrew should once again become a living language. It had been re relegated merely to religious documents and study rooms. But through his efforts, like a phoenix, it rose from the dead and became a living language. And the reason they say this Hebrew is so powerful is, you know, when it has this, the meaning and it has that vibration associated with it, and people are using this sacred, you know, these sacred words for sacred rituals all across the world, it has a combined really cool effect. Um, let's see what else we have in here. This looks like a cool little note here perhaps the word in Hebrew olam today generally means world but it originally it seems to have meant world universe aeons and forever um, so there's always the, the bland or the base interpretation of these mystical teachings you know and it's kind of condensed into these, you know, institutions and churches and different religious institutions so that the, the modern or average everyday person can understand them. As you get deeper into it, it gets a little more complicated. So um, some of this stuff is only set aside for the advanced students. So that's why the people that really need this information or this knowledge, like they'll end up finding this. I'm not really worried about that. You know, this isn't really for everyone, so to speak. 64, the bottom left paragraph. Let's see. Let us return to the word Kabbalah. It comes from a Hebrew word that means to receive, implying that the Kabbalah is a received doctrine, that is, received from God. It also means that it is given by one person and received by another, usually in, in an oral manner. Thus, the true Kabbalah was an oral secret tradition, which for thousands of years was jealously guarded from the profane. Unlike the tarot, as we had discussed in the tarot video, there's two types of histories. Uh, the first is a mythological history, and the second is the factual history. <clears throat> okay. And this transmission that they're talking about, this um, given by one person and received by another in an oral manner, um, Damien talks about this in the spirit science, um, not spirit science, oh my gosh, I'm getting that mixed up. I guess his little character on Midnight Gospel kind of reminds me of the spirit science stuff too. 
But on Midnight Gospel, that episode with Damien and Coles, you can look up the whole interview on YouTube, not just the interview segments that are in the um, episode itself. But on YouTube, you can watch a little bit more. And he talks about this current, you know, that's taken by real masters and somebody that's truly carrying this current of information, you know, they can channel it or give it to the next person and they carry this current with them. It's something that's, you know, um, given down through the lines, either from individual practitioner to their student, or if you're in some kind of order or a lodge or a temple or whatever your mystery t tradition is, you know, on down the line. And that's something I want to emphasize too. I think we're done in this book for today just hit 30 33 that was cool but um you know there's so many different mystical traditions out there and Damien was saying too it's really cool because there's a tradition that kind of fits every person you know at the end of the day it's all really kind of the same thing but which system is it that calls out to you you know which one's going to give you the best amount of enlightenment you know based upon what your background is what part of the world you come from you know, the Western stuff like ceremonial magic is a little more linear. I would say it's a little more linear and, um, you know, it has more of a grade system and it's a little more organized and like, rather than the Eastern, I'm not saying the Eastern stuff is disorganized or anything. It's so deep. It's, there's really, I guess it's a more condensed version, whereas the Eastern stuff's almost more difficult. It's, it's really not set up for our subconscious, for the people who were, you know, grew up in, in the West and stuff. It's the people in the east you know that grow up on that side of the world or whatever their subconscious and their cultural upbringings their religions and like even the nature around them and the culture around them is going to help them more with the eastern practices whereas our logical western you know industrialized you know probably way over industrialized thinking you know and more what i would consider robotic thinking versus organic thinking not saying one's completely one way or the other i'm just these are archetypal differences to kind of differentiate these two the western and the eastern but you know, there's different traditions and just at the end of the day, what I'm really trying to say is just pick the one that's best for you. Um, so yeah, I guess that pretty much concludes this video. Um, I haven't been doing them as often, but I still like to hear from you guys. Um, if you like what I'm doing, um, please let me know because um, it inspires me to do more of these videos. Um, let me know which topic you want me to cover um, because I, you know, I do like Dante and other novels and stuff, you know, as long as it's, you know, pertaining towards some kind of spiritual study or really just understanding of consciousness. I even have done an Atlas Shrugged video in here and, and Ayn Rand's not spiritual at all. She's pretty atheist. So. Um, but a lot of those teachings you can still, teachings from all kinds of things you can incorporate into your understanding, discern, see what everyone has to say, and then you can move forward on your own path from there. Um, I hope everybody's doing well. I hope everybody's staying healthy. Um, blessed and um, you know just remain at peace know that we're meant to be here we're meant to be here in this story um, you know of life um, if you weren't meant to be here you wouldn't be here just take it one day at a time if you feel overwhelmed in life you know it's, it's just one thing at a time don't stress about you know having to cover you know just take a deep breath this is what meditation and all these practices are for just self mastery you know mastery of the self Come into the understanding that everything's going to be okay. Um, we're all just learning on the earth. We are all one divine family. And we're coming into more of this understanding, I think, every single day as this information, you know, gets out. Um, we're really cultivating a beautiful world here. And I'm really looking excited, excited and looking forward to things. Um, feeling really good. And I want others to find this peace of mind within themselves. And, um, you know, it may not be perfect today, but gosh, we can transmute this. We have the power to, you know, with positive thinking and, and meditative practices and finding that peace of mind. And we can learn to carry it with us into the everyday world. We can learn to be calm. We can master these things. We can use our breath to um, be at peace, spread peace, love, and light. Well, I'm just going to keep rambling on if I don't quit. So peace and love, everybody. Have a great day.